Hello and welcome. We're live at the Guyana Space Centre for the launch of Intelsat 17 and Hylas 1. I'm Katie Haswell and joining me in the commentary box is Thomas Panozzo, who is a programme director at Arian Space. Yes, hello. And there was Ariane 5 on the pad. She's undergoing final preparation before launch tonight and that's scheduled for just under 14 minutes. And we'll be taking you through the launch until final separation of the satellites. Over to Jean-Yves Legal now for the rundown of tonight's mission. Well, the fifth launching for Ariane 5 in 2010 and the two clients for Ariane Espace on the one hand Intelsat 17 for the global operator Intelsat. Intelsat 17 will be the 51st satellite launched by Ariane Espace for Intelsat and Hylas 1, a satellite for newcomer Aventi Communications, which will be launching today's very first satellite. There, too, a very important client because, as you know, RNS Pass eagerly wishes to encourage newcomers on the space telecommunications market. Intelsat 17 was built by Space System Lowell in Palo Alto, California, and Hylas 1 was built by Astrium in cooperation with Heathrow, uh, the Indian Space Research Organization, as a part of a program supported by the European Space Agency. As I said, it will be the 51st launching of Ariane 5 ECA this year. There's a and yet another one to be organized by the end of 2010. And we will have a very busy agenda in 2011, starting as of the 15th of February with the launching of ATV-2 Johannes Kipler, normal, because since the beginning of the year, we have already signed 10 contracts for launching a geostationary orbit satellites, to which we must add other contracts for launchings with SOLAS. But without further ado, let us watch this launching in daytime with Ariane 5 ECA, Intelsat 17, and Hylas 1. So, a busy year ahead. Now, before launch, all eyes are on this screen. This is called the status panels, and it's a little bit like the dashboard in a car, isn't it, Thomas? Exactly, Katie. Actually, you need more than a launcher to make a launch. Basically, you need three things. So, first of all, uh, the satellite. Uh, the launch system, which is the launcher and the pad, and the range, things like telemetry, radars, weather, and flight safety. And they all send their status, and we can see them on the panel right now. They must all be green for launch. That's the case tonight. We are ready to go. And we are go for launch. This is Mission Control. It's known here often as the Jupiter Control Room. Our commentary box is actually in here. This is a special group of people we're looking at, the Flight Directorate. The head of the flight director is Geneve Legal, and they take all decision about the launch uh, in case unplanned situation arises. And obviously, Katie, the, the team across the base report to them in real time. And we have viewers from all around the world here tonight. Welcome to everybody at Intelsat and Laurel. Everyone at Avanti, ISA, Astrium and ISRO in India. Our friends at the UK Space Agency and everybody who's watching us at the BIS in Victoria Street. Hope you're having a lovely evening. Um, teams have been working very hard here in Kuru now for several months to prepare for today's launch, and it's a very carefully planned process. In recent times, Ariane Space has responded to a rapid launch rate of three launches in less than three months. And that means that teams need to adhere to strict operational planning in order to get everything ready within the time frame. This requires careful scheduling and a high level of organization. The person in charge of this is the COEL, or Launch Operations Manager. For this campaign, it's André Sikar who's here for his 10th mission. The key word is anticipation, above all in terms of human resources. We need to make sure people are available and for every job we allocate a backup person. Unexpected situations always arise and solutions have to be found. We also anticipate technical anomalies. Every potential anomaly is analyzed in detail to measure the possible effects it can have and corrective actions are put in place. 
Ariane Space's philosophy is always to offer the best possible solution, so the satellites are ready on the launch pad on time. During the final chronology, the key operations involve the filling of the main core stage and the upper stage with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. The rollout involves transferring the launcher to the pad. The launch operations manager needs his teams to be 100% available and dedicated to the success of the mission. The human factor is one of the major drivers during final chronology. We all need to react fast in unexpected situations. And we need a high level of technical expertise in order to have the timely launch that we have planned. And it's this proven organization that allows Ariane Space to offer its customers the reliability for which Ariane 5 is known worldwide. Now the base is made up of a range of different facilities, obviously we're looking here at the launch zone, but there are also the integration buildings, the satellite preparation facilities, um, and the whole thing is known as the range, incidentally that also includes the ground stations, which are dotted across the globe and they track the launcher as it uh, flies over. Mission control, wh which we're looking at now, is the nerve centre of the range, and all the information is collated here. Uh, Thomas, it's a little bit like the control tower at the airport, isn't it? Exactly. In this case, well, the airplane is the launcher and the passenger are, of course, the satellite. And the control tower gives the green light for takeoff when all the conditions are correct and then when uh, we are zero in the countdown, uh, which you can see on the top right part of your screen, actually. And there are several key people here in the uh, mission control. We've got the mission director tonight, it's uh, Thierry Wilmar. Uh, what does he do? Well, he's responsible for coordinating everything that concerns the satellite daily activities on the pad. He takes charge when the spacecraft arrives at the airport in Cayenne and basically sign off once all the activities have been completed after the launch. And then, of course, the other key person is the range operations manager. Tonight it's Bruno Gilles, um, or the DDO, as we say in French. He's like the head of the control tower. He runs the final countdown here in the mission control center. And it's uh, his uh, voice tous, uh, de DDO, attention pour la séquence finale lanceur. that we're listening to now because he makes all the key announcements throughout the Top H-7 minutes. And uh, he has just announced the uh, start of the synchronized sequence or automated sequence. This is a key milestone in the launch. It's the last seven minutes. What's happening, Thomas? Actually, two computers are now taking over from people as we get close to the launch. Uh, two, two big computers will manage an impressive list of operations during these last seven minutes. They are running all the final checks and controls, so the launcher is now becoming progressively automated. And by the time we get to zero in the countdown, well, Ariane 5 will be a fully automatic vehicle. And of course the people monitoring those operations are in launch control, so if mission control is the control tower, then launch control is a little bit like the cockpit, before launch anyway. It's three kilometers from the pad, often known as the bunker. This is the men and women now. Yeah, actually we have two teams, uh, one is responsible for the ground operations and the other for the readiness of the vehicle. So the first crew is added by the launch site operation manager, Coel, which is on the car tonight, and he asks mission control for permission, let's say, to take off, uh, then he launches the automatic sequence at minus seven minutes. The second crew is headed by the Ariane production manager, the CPAP, and this team warranties the flight readiness of the vehicle and it supervises all the operations involved in the launcher. And there's Ariane on the pad, very close to those people we've just seen. Um, just to remind you, we are in the Amazon rainforest. We're on the northeastern coast of South America, right on the equator. It's hot, it's humid. Uh, there aren't too many mosquitoes at the <laughs> moment. <laughs> we've had the last weather check, and uh, the weather's been quite beautiful for the last few days, hasn't it? Yes, Katie. Today it's a nice sunny day. A uh, few clouds passed by this morning, uh, nothing nasty. I think that Mother, Mother Nature is with us today for the launch. But indeed, we need to remember that the weather changes quickly here in French Guiana. Uh, you know, right now we are at the beginning of the rainy season, but we have not seen much rain yet. And can rain stop a launch? Not at all. Rain is not an issue. But we do need to monitor other things, uh, which is the strength and direction of the high altitude winds, uh, convective clouds and thunderstorm, in order to avoid any risk from lightning, since the launcher goes so fast through the clouds after takeoff. But tonight, no issue. The weather is green and uh, everything is ready to go. Um, Ariane 5 is a big, strong, reliable beast of a workhorse. She's divided into three main stages, the solid rocket boosters, 31.6 kilometers high, and weighing roughly the equivalent of 10 big lorries. 
The EPC, the main cryogenic uh, stage with uh, mass takeoff, almost 190 tons, provided with a Vulcan 2 engine, very, very powerful cryogenic engine. The upper stage is also a cryogenic upper stage, uh, height 4.71 metres, and it's roughly the size of a small studio apartment. And on the very top, uh, we have the fairing, uh, 17 metres high, and the all launcher is 50 metres high, like 20-storey building, Katie. And uh, at the top of uh, the fairing, inside the fairing, our two passengers are there, tucked up underneath the nose of the vehicle, Intelsat 17-4 uh, Intelsat, built by Loral in the US. Um, and Hylas 1 for Avantic Communications of London, built by Astrium and ISRO in uh, India. They're both sitting comfortably in first class with their seat belts on. <laughs> <laughs> first class, Katie, as you say. Everything is very carefully controlled inside the fairing. First of all, it's very clean. Humidity control, air conditioning to provide the spacecraft with the perfect temperature. And above all, the satellites are linked to control benches in the satellite preparation facilities where talented engineers from uh, Loral, ISRO and Astrium monitor Earth status until liftoff. And if we were to put our X-ray glasses on, this is what we would see under the fairing. Um, here we can see the configuration of the spacecraft. Highlight uh, is underneath um, and Intelsat 17 on the top. Intelsat 17 built by Space System Loral weighing 5,540 kilograms grams at takeoff, we reach 66 degree east orbital position to provide service over Asia and Indian Ocean. And on the lower part within the SILDA, we have ILAS-1 for the end customer Avanti Communication based in London. Broadband services uh, through this uh, satellite weighting is slightly more than 2.5 tons uh, at takeoff. Now, if we take a look at the top third of the launcher, we're zooming in here, you can see the cryotechnic arms which are coming from the umbilical tower and clamping onto the upper stage of the vehicle. What they're doing is they're feeding cryotechnic propellant to the upper stage. That's liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and it's at extremely low temperatures, Thomas. Yes, minus 250 Celsius for the liquid hydrogen. It's slightly warmer for the oxygen, but still minus 210 Celsius. And actually, we fill the tanks of the upper stage until the very last possible moment. That's because the fluids are so cold that they evaporate. And what we could see there was the close-up of those uh, arms clamping on. Yeah, and you will see those arms, the yellow that you see on the screen right now, will disconnect just before launch. And uh, something to watch out for, something else, of course, to watch out for, is that uh, there is a seven-second delay between the ignition uh, of the engines and liftoff. What's that about? Exact. Uh, we ignite the Vulcan engine first, then the onboard computers check for it for seven seconds uh, to make sure that it's working properly, and then we light the boosters. That's the point of no return, and the launcher takes off. Yeah, there's nothing we can do to hold it back at that point. We're approaching now the one minute mark. Attention pour moi une minute. We're switching all systems now to flight mode. Top.